Hello, it's Honey Laird here, and welcome to part four of lecture 11 of ENGR 231 Engineering Statics. In this video, I'm going to get into the main potatoes of really describing how to analyze frames in simple machines. And I'm gonna list a, a technique a, or a series of steps that we'll be using in the next portion of the lecture when we actually run through a series of examples of this. So let's actually get into a description of using the uh, using the tools we've already discussed uh, in the earlier portions of this lecture and in earlier videos to analyze frames and simple machines. So frames and simple machines methods of analysis. Analysis method. Our first step is going to be to uh, do what is essentially a global equilibrium analysis, as we discussed in part three of this lecture. So one, uh, do a global equilibrium analysis or a global free body diagram. A global equilibrium analysis. Again, treating the entire truss as a single rigid body. So what you're doing here, you're going to treat the entire truss as a single rigid body. And the goal of that is to solve for as many of your external reaction forces as possible. Uh, so solve for as many reaction forces as possible. Uh, reaction forces as possible. And once you have that, we're going to move on to more local analysis. So the second step is going to be to draw an exploded view of every member in the, in the framework or in the frame or in the machine. Uh, two, draw an exploded view of every member in the frame. A member. And so when we do that, what we're going to do is uh, we are going to, well, we're going to do a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, draw each member in relation to the others. What I mean by that is just literally draw them uh, similar to this with all of the, with their correct orientations, their approximate locations, etc. Two, show the forces that pass through the joints. Uh, the appropriate forces that pass through joints. And three, uh, make sure to uh, label the forces, usually by joint name. And that's somewhat arbitrary. I mean, you can just call them whatever you want. They're just forces. Uh, their actual naming is purely arbitrary, just your choice, whatever is uh, convenient to you. I usually use, uh, you'll, you'll see me later on and what you've already seen me use so far. Uh, I tend to use a system that's like oh, BY, BX, MB, uh, for the forces, I tend to use a uh, joint and then joint name and then a subscript for the direction. And then for moments, I just tend to use like a capital letter and then a subscript of the joint for whatever joint we're looking at. But you can use whatever you prefer. And many books will use different systems and things like that as well. Many textbooks. Um, by joint name or other method. Oh, and when I say appropriate joints, uh, the uh, appropriate forces that pass through joints, what I mean by this mainly is pin, uh, roller, and uh, fixed, etc. You want to make sure that if you have a fixed joint, that you're passing two uh, directions of translational force and one uh, moment through there. If you have only a roller joint, then you want to make sure that you're transmitting only a uh, single perpendicular translational force through that joint. And then maybe uh, four here. Make sure that you're applying uh, Newton's third law. Uh, 
appropriately. So um, members are going to transmit force through joints or joints are going to transmit force from one member to another. And it doesn't matter usually, usually at least it doesn't matter what direction you assume, but what uh, in terms of whether one member is experiencing upward force or a downward force, but what you do need to do is assume compatibility. So here, this BX was pointing to the right. I don't really, it doesn't really matter whether I initially assume that BX is to the right or to the left on this bottom member. But if I assume BX is moving uh, the bot this uh, column here to the right, then this BX here, which is this right word, or this this right arrow here, that BX has to go to the left. You have to have compatible um, forces. So again, if you have something like this, you can assume whatever you want. But if this is going to be to the right, then this has to be to the left. You could have this go to the right, but this has to go to the left. It if it was a, if you have a vertical force here, an, or an upward force here, then the downward force has to be on this one. If this one is pointing upward, then this one has to be pointing downward. If this moment is counterclockwise, then this moment has to be clockwise. You can have this one be counterclockwise if you want to assume that, but um, this one would have to then be clockwise. They have to be equal and opposite. Now, uh, when I say it can be either way, what I really mean is you're in, for your initial analysis, for your, or for your initial drawing, your initial exploded view, you can assume either one. However, ultimately your math will tell you, uh, when you work through the equations of equilibrium, the math will tell you whether your assumption was right or wrong. And you know what? It's fine. There's no problem with assuming a wrong direction. Um, all that means is that, that if you do all the math right, you'll get a negative number on the back end, and that just means that you assume the, the, the wrong direction initially, and that's fine. No big deal. Um, just switch it around in a final drawing if you wish. So we have that. Um, let's see. So, ah, um, then a thing, a few other things I should in the next major step, step three. Uh, three will then be to apply equilibrium. Apply equilibrium equations. to each member individually. Uh, to each member individually, so you'll be doing sum of forces x, sum of forces y, and some uh, balance of moments. Some balance of moments. And you'll just have to uh, work through those. And on any given member, you'll only be able to solve using only that one member for three unknown forces, because uh, you only have three equations of equilibrium. And that's fine, because often you'll be able to, you may have to work through many different members to solve for all the forces, but ultimately you should be able to do it if, of course, the frame is statically determinant. Uh, it is very easy to draw a frame that is not statically determinant, but in statics class we try to keep things simple, and the uh, problems that we'll ask you to work through, they, uh, we of course give you ones that are statically determinant, or at least mostly so for doing our job right. So, uh, let's see here. Mm. But that basically does cover it. That's most of what you need to be aware of, um, et cetera, et cetera. A few other things, points of note. Uh, so that is the main method. Um, that is the main method. But there are a few things I would like to discuss that are more notes than uh, full things of the method. Uh, notes. Or things that will uh, are particularly, uh, things that you need to be looking out for. One, two force members. or two pin members, I should probably say. Or, as we discussed back when we first learned about trusses, I called these truss condition members. If you have, and in that original video when we worked through this, um, back in lecture eight, I believe, or maybe, no, lecture nine, um, when we were working through this, we defined a truss member as one with pin joints on either end. And we saw the consequence for that was that just because, of, solely because you have pins on either end of a member, uh, that will basically guarantee that that uh, member carries a single axial force. So basically just a single axial force. But 
um, we use this mainly in trusses. We said that we had an entire framework composed of this type of member, but in our initial analysis, we didn't actually look at any other members. We just said, we have this one member and it's joined by pins, what happens? Well, the trust member condition or the two pin member, or also sometimes referred to as a single force member, there are many different ways to describe the same thing. This doesn't ultimately care whether this member is in a truss that's made entirely of these, or it's in something else. So for example, if you have a framework like this, uh, let's say, uh, maybe I'll do something like this. Let's say it's, oh, something like this. Mm, and this here. When I go and draw this, oh, actually, let me, oh, I need to actually draw my pin member. Let's say I have this, oh, let's keep it relatively simple so I can do it with three members. So I have basically a, you know what, I don't like how tiny that is. Let me just, oh, slides are cheap. Let's just go ahead and draw this nice and big. And I can have more notes on the other page. So let's say I have a beam and a column in fixed joints. So I have, a fixed, uh, I have a fixed column here, or a column that is fixed to the ground. Then there is a fixed connection between this beam and this column. But then I have a uh, another element here giving um, support. And this is going to be uh, have pins on either end. So I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to call this uh, joint A, B, C, uh, D, and E. And maybe I'll separate this into three pieces. I'll have, um, so basically I'm showing you how the, uh, how the exploded view for this would look. And let's say this is at a certain angle theta here. The center line of that is at some, theta, some angle theta. Well, let's look at the exploded view of this. I would separate this into three pieces. I would not want to split this into, uh, I would not want to split these, uh, the beam and the column, or the column and the beam into two pieces because the column and beam really do continue. The column be, uh, continues through joint B and the beam continues through joint D. So while I could separate it, it's really not needed. And it would just make my life a little more difficult. So what kind of, uh, so let's just draw these three out and then let's look at what kind of um, member forces we would have or member end forces we would have. We're not yet looking at forces that are actually inside individual members. We'll get that, uh, we'll get to that in lecture 12. So something to look forward to. <laughs> So let's say we have this here. And uh, let's see, this is going to be B here and D here. And so this is going to be column, I would call this column A, uh, A, B, C. And then C here. And then I would have, I, I, I like to draw the same joints here. So C. D, the pin here, and E. Now, let's say, oh, well, for consistency or for, to make sense, let's say there originally was some external force P applied to this. Well, let's look at what the global free body diagram of this would look like. I'm not going to actually solve this one right now. I'm not going to put numbers to it, but I just want to look at what the exploded, uh, sorry, not the global, the local or the exploded free body diagrams would look like. So I would have some sort of uh, AX, some sort of the, the usual reactions here, uh, ignoring that this AX would probably be zero, but I could have an AX, an AY, and an MY here, or sorry, an MA here. These, this is just your standard moment support or moment reaction or fixed support that we've seen previously. Then at joint C, I would have a CX, which would be applied to both of the members, to both the beam here and the column. But since I assumed CX was going to the right on the on this one, I have to assume it's going to the left on this one. Then I would have some sort of CY. And if I'm going to assume it's going it's acting upward on the column, I would have to assume it's acting downward on the beam. CY? Well, this one, that's not very uh, likely at all. It's probably going to be upward, but whatever. That's fine. And then some sort of MC here. And then in the opposite direction, MC. And that's fine. That's how, that's something I've looked at before. Uh, but what I really want to talk about in this slide is this case here. So 
we know that this member is going to carry a single force, and that force is going to be either tension or compression directly along its axis. So, um, well, I can just look at this and say it's probably going to be in compression, so I'm just going to draw it like that. I have a single force, and I'm just going to go ahead and call name that the same way I would name any truss member force. I'm just going to name that FBD. FBD and an FBD. And it's directly along the axis of the member. Then I have acting on here, equal and opposite, the same FBD. And then here, equal and opposite to the one on this end, the same FBD. So this is how we can use um, the truss member condition when in a frame analysis. FBD. Uh, oh, my mouse is bothering me again. Sorry about that. FBD here. And that's the basic idea. And this would be, and as far as what angle this would be at, that would just be at whatever angle theta that truss member is at, or that uh, single force member is at. That would be that theta. And that would also be at theta. And that is the basic uh, way of applying. Uh, whenever you basically, whenever you see a uh, a truss type member, you can immediately you don't have to do the whole um, you know bx and by like you normally would at any other pin joint. If you have a member that is uh, pins on either end, you will have a single force. Now, I will mention another case of two force members that we have, or uh, two pin members that we haven't really looked at before. Um, I focused purely on the mem on on the truss members that are straight. But interestingly enough, if you actually work through the equations of equilibrium, it works just as well if the member is curved. A curved uh, two-pin member. I didn't want to cover this when I looked at trusses because uh, trusses by definition have straight members, but um, the same condition of having a single force does apply even if your thing is very curved. Uh, however, it does become a little bit more complex. So let's say you have a pin here and a pin here and maybe joint B here, not another joint A. And let's say you have some kind of weird, curvy, arcy member, arcing member. And this is not my poor drawing skill, just my poor drawing skills. This is actually meant to be a curved member. So if you have this condition, if you actually work through the equations of equilibrium and do the same kind of thing we did before, where we put a local axis from one joint to another, this be your local x-axis, this be your local y-axis, and run through the balance of moments, you will find the same condition does apply. However, uh, for a, cur a curved uh, two-pin member, will transmit a single force. A single force. Uh, a single force. And that will be, though, uh, along an axis between the pinned ends. So, um, because it's curved, the one difference, so it, so the, the pins will guarantee that it's carrying global, uh, carrying at least on the outside a single force, but the difference is that because it's curved, it won't be along the axis. You can't carry a single vector on a curved axis. So instead what happens is we look at the axis, um, basically if the curve wasn't there. We look at this axis here. The, the axis from A to B, and that is the axis that the single member force will be, will, will be directed along. So we'll have an FAB and another FAB here, like this. Now, in terms of uh, solving for end forces in, some, in frames and simple machines, that will be adequate. However, if you have, um, once we get to uh, member internal forces, we'll see that this is actually uh, not quite, this is, that's where things get really different in this compared to a straight member, a straight two pin member, because uh, this is going to produce bending. If you think about, if you think about uh, this type of thing, if you imagine squeezing in on this from both ends, you're going to induce like a bending action into that curved member, where you wouldn't if it was just a simple straight member, and then you were just compressing it like you would any other column. So that was the first thing I wanted to note. Uh,
two pin members. Two, I want to mention distributed loads. Uh, distributed loads. Distributed loads. Uh, here, so for distributed loads, what I, what I mean by distributed load is, uh, we've looked at these a bit before, but a distributed load is, of course, one that is applied over a length of a beam or a length of a column or length of a member rather than at a single location. Uh, most of the time we look at point loads, but we can also have distributed loads. So a distributed load would be, say, like you have a column maybe a, or maybe a beam or just any kind of member. Uh, maybe one with pin joints or something like that, or maybe I'll just say it has a fixed, uh, you know what, I'll just go ahead and draw a frame. That's going to make me, that'll make me happy. Something like this. And then maybe I'll have a pin joint over here. And then down here, maybe I'll have another pin support. like this here. And so then I will go and uh, let's say I have a distributed load like this. And maybe, a, or I could have a distributed load like this. Something like this here. And so those are distributed loads. They're not applied at a single location. They are applied over an area and they're given in lengths of, they're given in units of force per unit length. They're like uh, kips per, uh, per uh, foot, uh, kips per inch, pounds per foot, pounds per inch, uh, kilonewtons per meter, kilonewtons per centimeter, or that'd be a lot, uh, newtons per centimeter, something of that order. Now, uh, how do you handle these? Well, if solving for member internal forces, we haven't gotten there yet. Internal forces, uh, for example, a shear, bending moment, and axial load, you cannot use what I'm going to refer to as the equivalent point load method. So we're not there yet. We'll get to that next section or next lecture. We cannot use the equivalent point load method. We're not allowed to do that yet because as we'll see when we get to shear and moment diagrams, once we start uh, looking at what kind of forces are actually inside individual members and cutting them and saying, okay, how much shear is present, how much bending moment is present, all that kind of thing, then you need to actually consider how um, that is distributed as a function. But if solving for member end forces If you're solving for member end forces, uh, then you can use the equivalent point load method. Uh, equivalent point load method. Now we haven't gotten directly to centroids yet, um, at least centroids by integration, that sort of thing. But I thought I hope by now, in at this level of your uh, engineering education, you have at least been exposed to centroids. Uh, this is something that you see in basic physics courses, uh, even some high school physics and things like that. Uh, so hopefully you are at least aware of a centroid. If not, you can uh, look that up fairly quickly in a physics text. Although we will talk about more advanced forms of centroids as we move forward. Uh, maybe a couple lectures from now. Now, um, if I were to go and uh, look at this. So or let me just quickly describe what, what I mean by the equivalent point load method. A uh, point load method. Essentially, what I what you do with the equivalent point load method is replace a distributed load of. Oh, well, maybe I can just describe it like this. Uh, again, you can only do this for the point for the uh, purpose of solving for member end forces. But uh, in cases where you can use it, it's great. You simply replace uh, the distributed load. with an equal magnitude point load at the centroid of that load, 
at the centroid of that load distribution. A load distribution. For example, if you have a triangular load, um, maybe something, let's just draw the beam out for a beam out first. And let's say it starts out at zero and increases to, oh, I don't know, let's say uh, six kips per foot. Oh, that's a little high. Uh, let's say three kips per foot. Three kips per foot. And let's say this thing is 10 feet long. Uh, 10 feet. Actually, let's make it 12 feet long. So this beam is 12 feet long. Well, I know from my study of centroids and from basic statics and physics and such that the centroid of a triangle or of a right triangle is one third from its base. And so what that means is um, I know the centroid of this load is actually only one third uh, the distance across. It's not going to be where it's not going to be in the middle. That wouldn't really make sense. If you think about it, most of the load is going to be on the right hand side of this beam, and that distance is one third. So the centroid of this load is right about there. And that distance is uh, that distance is uh, one third, twelve foot over three or four feet. So I can replace this again only for the sake of finding member end forces with an equivalent point load. And how do I find that equivalent point load? Well, it's just, just basic geometry. What is the area of a triangle? The area of a triangle is one half base times height. And so we treat this as just like an area method, essentially. One half base times height. So let me go ahead and get a, I'll draw this out. And I'll say we have a P here, an equivalent point load. And it's one half base times height. And that's again for the area of a triangle. And that's one half times 12 feet uh, times 12 feet uh, times 3 kips per foot. So that's just uh, 6 times 3 or 18 kips total. You can just use an area approach. Uh, 18 kips total. And as far as the dimension on that, that is going to be uh, 4 feet from the right hand side of the beam. And you can do this when, uh, again, analyzing, uh, you can do this for either the global analysis or for the local analysis, and you often just want to do it right off the bat. It's a very quick way um, of solving for member end forces. Again, you can't do everything, you can't use this for solving for internal forces, but it's very useful when um, solving for member end forces. Okay, uh, let's see, uh, what else? Um... Okay, so there's that. And then finally, I should probably mention couples. And of course, now, as far as what you're likely to see on these, um, usually on these type of problems, we don't give you anything too gnarly that you have to do integration for or something. Uh, we tend to limit it to just, you know, um, triangular loads and point loads or rectangular loads like this. You're unlikely to see anything really horrible, but you never know. Usually I save anything uh, more complex than triangle and rectangular loads for when we talk about uh, finding centroids by integration. Three, couples. Couples can be applied to frames and simples machines. Remember that couples have no moment arms. That's a, co a common source of error. Remember that couples have no moment arms. So it doesn't matter. Um, they are considered, are always present, and they're also always present uh, when, one, uh, doing the global analysis, doing a global analysis, or two, uh, looking at a, a piece where the couple is actually applied on, and doing a local analysis On the particular member where a couple is present. A couple where a member is present. Or sorry, where uh, on a member where a couple is present. 
Gotta get that right, where a couple is present or applied. So if you have a simple frame, let's draw this as a stick diagram right now. Uh, pin, pin, and then maybe some fixed joints around. And if you had a couple to it, you would use this couple when uh, doing the global free body diagram on the entire thing. And then when you did a local analysis just on the beam, that couple would show up and you would not have to multiply it by any distance. You would only simply add the magnitude of the couple to this thing. Uh, but when you did the local analysis on this one and on this one, these two columns, that the couple would not show up, although it would still have an influence on those columns because it, 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 it is what is, uh, it would be uh, contributing to the reaction forces on these. Okay. And really, that's all that remains of this. This is, I think that about covers the theory of how we can use um, the method that we can use all of the tools at our disposal to analyze frames and simple machines. And then I think in the, fi the par part five, the final part of this lecture, uh, we will go in and actually work through several examples of applying basic static equilibrium and local and global analysis and all of the things that we have seen uh, finally uh, to finally actually work through some uh, long form examples of uh, solving frames and simple machines uh, looking and primarily looking for member end forces all right that'll do for now please let me know if you have any questions hope you've all uh, enjoyed this thank you for bearing with me as we go through all of this theory preparing finally to get the last portion of this lecture where we can finally start putting some numbers on the page but i will see you all soon for part five where we work we, where we start working through um actually applying uh numerical examples uh to frames and simple machines again pl please let me know if you have any questions hope you found all this uh hopefully not too boring and hopefully illuminating uh but if not uh, uh regardless i'll see you soon for part five and as always thank you